Good morning, and welcome to the July 11th worship service of Shelbyville First United Methodist Church, the Church on the Square. On this, the seventh Sunday of Pentecost, we welcome our listeners on WLIJ AM and FM, our viewers on Facebook Live, and everyone worshiping here in the sanctuary. Our pastor is the Reverend Dr. Paul H. Mulliken. Musicians are Lori Schuler and John Brock. Technical assistance provided by Wayne Crowell, Cassie Davis, Rachel Swift, and Jeannie Phillips. Our Director of Student Ministries, Ashley Porter, is at Lake Junaluska, the retreat with several of our youth. And Dale Rucker uh, was going to be our lay liturgist, but Dale is dealing with some sickness this morning. And we definitely appreciate the help of Joan Leishner for filling in as our lay liturgist this morning. The flowers in the chancel area are presented to the glory of God and in celebration of the marriage of Rebecca and Rydell Jacobson. The white rose in the chancel area is in memory of our dear member, Helen Scales Collier, who has joined the church triumphant. In, in the way of announcements today, uh, Tuesday at 10.15 a.m., the U United Methodist Women Executive Meeting will take place, followed at 11 o'clock by the full general meeting of United Methodist Women. The month of August will be a very special month as we are going to have worship services that will feature lots of singing. It will be a more relaxed uh, casual attire for that month and we would like to know your favorite hymn and even more importantly we'd like to know why that hymn is so meaningful to your life you can call the church office and leave a voicemail uh, we're looking at putting an insert uh, into the bulletin where you can list your favorite hymn and the reason that you love that hymn so we look forward to that. Also during the month of August, we look forward to the resumption of the Chancel Choir. And then uh, Wesley Warriors and Angel Choir, the plan right now is to start those back up the Wednesday after Labor Day, uh, which I believe is September 8th. So much to look forward to, and there'll be much more information forthcoming this month. And now, let us prepare our hearts to experience the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Let us pray. As we worship this morning, O oh God, we pray that your spirit will be our strength, your word will be our guide, your love will be our comfort, and your promises will be our hope. We gather now to praise you, O oh God, in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you're able as we share responsively our call to worship, which you will find posted in your bulletin or on our church website. Let us give praise to the Lord of our salvation in Christ Jesus. Only, Only in, in Christ, Christ have, have we received, received the, the blessing of, of eternal, eternal life. Above all names is Christ to be praised for showing us God's love. And we and are called, called to, share to share God's, God's love, love throughout, throughout the, world. the world. Let us join together in singing God of grace and God of glory. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Round thine ancient church's story, bring her but to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. For the facing of this hour. <coughs> the of evil around us, scorn thy Christ, assail his ways. Fears that <coughs> too long have bound us, free our hearts to work and pray. Does wisdom grant us courage for the living of these days? Just open up our hearts, open up the doors of our, not only our hearts, but of this church building that all may feel welcome. Would you join me responsibly as we pray? <clears throat> oh God, make the door of this house wide enough to receive all who need human love and fellowship. And narrow enough to shut out envy, pride, and strife. But rugged and strong enough. To, uh, but make it threshold smooth enough to be no stumbling block to children, nor to straying feet. But rugged and strong enough to turn back evil's power. Oh God, make the circle of this family of faith wide enough to welcome all who come. Wide enough to see everyone as part of your huge adopted family. Oh God, open our hearts wide enough so that they may be Wide enough to love everyone as Christ has loved them. Amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the things done with His 
power, he has saved me. With his power, he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Thank you. You may be seated as we continue into a spirit of prayer. <coughs> My, what a week this has been. It's some one of those kind of roller coaster weeks with joys and sorrows, twists and turns, but God is a good foundation that can help us withstand all that life throws at us. We, I do want to give thanks to God for the folks in our church who are willing to step up to the plate when needed. I appreciate Dale's willingness to serve as our lay liturgist and, and Joan at the last minute to step in on behalf of, of Dale. I want to... Um, uh, and, of course, they had to do this because Ashley has got our youth at Lake Junaluska this week. Barb and I will be leaving this afternoon to go join them on their tour of the Biltmore tomorrow. But uh, we ask that you will pray for the youth that God's Spirit might touch their hearts as they are at that wonderful place called Lake Junaluska. And they are gathered with youth from all across our southeastern jurisdiction and that their hearts may be blessed and strengthened in love for God and one another. Uh, we offer congratulations uh, to Rebecca and Rydell Jacobson, who were united in Christian marriage yesterday evening. May their home always be a, a place, a haven of blessing and a, and a place of peace. We have had a couple of services as we have laid to rest some folks who are part of our, have had connections to our church family and who are now in the church triumphant. Uh, we, of course, have already mentioned the right rose being for Helen Collier, we want to keep Carrie and their two sons and all of their family in our prayers. And uh, we, I'd like for you to remember Cyan and Corinne Bass. Many of you may not remember them. Trish, Miss Corinne is, is Trish Hubbard's aunt, but uh, their son Steve in uh, Marietta, Georgia, called me up a few months ago. And um, Mr. Cyan, both of those were born back in 1919. And Mr. Cyan was uh, served as a World War two pilot in the Army Air Force, and she has worked faithfully by his side, and, and uh, I did not get to know them, but I got to know a little of them as I gathered with the family at uh, Willamont this past, uh, well, yesterday, I believe it was, and uh, they were come back home. They haven't been here since the late 50s or early 60s, so we were glad to receive, uh, receive their family back for a day. Uh, we continue to remember Ernest uh, Limbo, who is recovering from his wrist surgery. Uh, Kate Madden did not receive a good report about her lungs this past week, so lift Kate especially in your prayers. And I'd like to ask a personal privilege of many of you have prayed for my uh, counselors and helpers at Camp Joy. One of my RCs, the resident counselors who works all summer at Lakeshore, on the first night, he shared with me his concern because his grandfather was gravely ill. And come to find out, his grandmother and his grandfather were former members of my church back in Decaturville. And I saw his mom and his two uncles grow up as kids. And they were faithful members of Decaturville, and they have moved to be with the family. Well, not only has his grandfather uh, had a stroke, uh, with, which was due also to the cancer he was battling, but his grandmother found out 10 days later she had cancer, and so they are both now on hospice. So just surround Jaden in your prayers and all of their family, and uh, I'm going to let him know that y'all are going to be lifting him in your prayers. <clears throat> if there are other concerns that come into your hearts and minds, please call our church office, and we'll do our best to keep you aware of this. Uh, those who did not know about Helen until this morning, uh, we do have our one-call tell-all uh, system, and that call went out at the first of the week. So if you did not get one, check with the office to make sure your number is on that list so that you can be called during the week. But now let us take a moment and catch our breath and just feel the presence of God in our hearts as we enter into this spirit of prayer.
Blessed are you, O God, for all of your goodness to us. In Christ we meet your love and wisdom face to face. Through the Holy Spirit we recognize the abilities and the opportunities you have created in us and for us to reach out to this world you love. We thank you for all the ways friends and families, neighbors and strangers reach out to us and to others, offering support and kindness, speaking up when we must confront wrongdoing, celebrating when achievements bless us, all with healing and with abiding joy. Today we pray for courageous leaders in cities and countries and congregations who strive to serve with integrity and honesty and especially love in a world prone to self-interest. We pray for those who struggle to create justice where it has been compromised and to build reconciliation and understanding in divided communities and families. We pray for patient church members and community volunteers who work diligently toward long-term goals that will improve our lives together, who plant those seeds and trust in you to bring the growth. We pray for the creative impatient change makers who keep challenging us to to be bolder and more determined in righting the wrongs and and even trying new strategies to do all we can to make a difference in this world. We pray for the troubled in mind or spirit, those who are angry and unhappy, for those who feel that every day is a struggle. Soothe their concerns and open their hearts to claim the hope and the help that you offer. We remember before you the sick and the dying and the bereaved who are now trying to put their lives back together again with the the empty seat in their homes. We pray for those who are looking for better health, a fresh start, more stability, or a glimpse of hope. Draw close to all of these who suffer, offering your comfort and courage to face whatever comes next. Receive our prayers, both spoken and unspoken, and embrace us all in your gracious law. Give us hearts to understand not only what you do on our behalf, but also what you call us to do on your behalf, because we are friends and followers of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians tells us that we have received an inheritance in Christ, God's gift to us in Christ and in creation, allow us to be generous in response to the needs of God's world. And what we give to God speaks to the world of God's generosity as well as our own. And trust me, the world is listening to what we have to say. Let us pray. Generous God, we we look around at the growth in gardens and fields this summer, and we trust in the generosity you have planted within your creation. Bless the gifts we bring that they too may grow in fruitfulness and touch the lives in need with your generous love. In the name of Christ, our help and our hope. Amen.
Please remain standing as you are so that we can prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. Let us pray. God of word and wisdom, as we hear the scriptures read and interpreted today, enlighten our minds, nurture our souls, embolden our hearts, and stir our minds so that we may live out your word in the world you love. Amen. Our morning scripture reading today is Ephesians 1, 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things, according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks. Lady God. <clears throat> you may be seated.
Thank you, John and Laura. You continue to bless us every time you share with us the gift of music. Well, I'm looking forward to August, our camp meeting month, to hearing some of the songs that are important to you and meaningful to you. I don't know if you're challenged like I am. It's so hard for me to narrow down to pick out which would be my favorite. But one of those that would be picked out as my favorite is number 233 in the Cokesbury Hymnal, Love Lifted Me. How many of you remember that one? Well, sing it with me. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Have you ever felt that you needed to be lifted up in life? Have you ever had those times when things just seemed to be just spiraling out of control and you felt so down and low that you thought, how can I take another step forward? And you needed something to bring you back to where you needed to be. Well, the letter that Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, he's trying to lift the eyes of the believers to more fully experience grace. Yes, we Christians love to say that word grace. We we love to sing about how amazing grace is. But I wonder how much we personally experience grace in our lives. My guess is that sometimes many of us are, are pretty reluctant to actually embrace and fully live by grace. We want to have our limits. Oh, I'll love you this far, but don't push it any farther than that. But verse 2, here this, this, this letter kind of is written for us, not just to the church there, but the church today. Verse 2 tells us that the first recipients of this letter was the saints who are in Ephesus. Now these aren't the ones that had halos above them. It's just the regular church folks who believe in Christ. That's who the saints are. That's who you are. So now that this word is in our Bible for us today, I guess we could probably... Uh, clarify who this letter is today, who is to receive this message today, we need to make a slight change in verse 2 in the way this letter is addressed. Instead of being to all the saints in, in Ephesus, let's say it's to all the saints in Shelbyville or in Bedford County or wherever else we call home. And then Paul gives us the very main reason for us today. He clarifies what a subject matter is right off the bat so you don't have to worry what this letter is about. He says, grace, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, this is a love letter from God to you and me about grace. And I do believe that there are many in this world today who want to know how to live lives that are Spiritually fulfilling, lifting us up, and socially responsible, lifting up others in this world. And I wonder if, if, if you might be including those folks who long for that in your lives. Are you wanting to sing in your hearts, pray in your hearts, Lord, lift me today. We're told in this passage how we can go about living in this way with one word that is just jam-packed with good news. That's simple but important important word, grace. And if you're interested in how you can find healing in life from all the wounds and losses in your lives, how you can find lasting joy in living, how you can make a difference in this world for God, we can find the answer to all of these aspirations in this one little word, grace. And, and, and if you notice... The passage that really is for the lectionary is verses 3 through 14. And in those few verses, grace is mentioned three times. We, we need grace, Paul wants us to know. We, we need to receive grace. We, we need to give grace. We, we need to live grace. We need to trust in God's grace. The verses of this passage is thought to be an early Christian doxology. It was none other than a song of praise to God and God's graciousness. And in, in this early Amazing Grace hymn, Paul outlines for us 
the life of grace. And he begins right off the bat in verse 4 by writing this. The beginning point of the life of grace is found when you and I start living lives, are you ready for this, that are holy and blameless before God. Rut row. <laughs> that leaves me out right away. How about you? But let's not give up before we even get started here. Although we know all too well that we are not even close to being holy and blameless. I want you to look a little closer at what Paul is actually saying here in this verse. Read it carefully because Paul was particular in the words that he picked out for us to hear. Paul says that we have been chosen by God not because we are home, holy and blameless. No, he says we are chosen by God to be holy and blameless. Not because we're already that, but that's what God intends for us to be. Now, you might remember that last week we talked about what happened when Jesus returned to his hometown, Nazareth, how they took offense at him. Do you recall, do you recall why they were offended at Jesus back then? Among other things, they did not like it that Jesus was always surrounded by people they did not like being around. People that they did not approve of. He describes them as prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners of all types. These were certainly not holy people. Not like all the good folk of Nazareth. These decent folk who religiously followed the law and observed the Sabbath, these folks of Nazareth, they were certainly, you know, the, the, these others that were surrounding Jesus were certainly not blameless people like the, the locals who, who worked hard to make a living, who faithfully raised their children with discipline and tried to be the best good citizens they could be. If anyone was even close to being found holy and blameless, they would certainly be found among the citizens of Nazareth and not this riffraff of society that kept hanging around Jesus. And yet, Jesus makes a surprising announcement. These seeming characters who were following him, these prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners, he announces that they are actually the ones whom Jesus sees as holy and blameless. And, and these fine, upstanding citizens of Nazareth, well, they're anything but. Oh, my. Wait just one moment. How can that be? That don't make any sense at all to us. Well, I suppose you could say that these people of Nazareth could be called holy and blameless if they are measured in human terms. They kept all the right rules. They said all the right words. They believed all the right beliefs. And they lived pretty good and decent lives. However, while they may have looked like they were pretty hot stuff in human terms, they were not seen as holy and blameless before God. And why could that, why would that be? Because God measures holiness and blamelessness differently than we people do. I want you to listen further to what the Apostle Paul writes here. He says, God chose us to be holy and blameless before God in love. Love is what makes all the difference in the world. This was the difference between the good people of Nazareth who were missing God's boat and this bunch of humanity's bad apples who Jesus surprisingly declared would inherit the kingdom of God. These tax collectors, sinners who were following Jesus. You know why they were with him? You know why they liked hanging around Jesus? Having been first loved by Jesus. That's how they were drawn by him. They had felt him loving them. And when people feel that you love them, 
They might listen to what you have to say, or they might follow in the ways of God if you, if you would just love them. Start off doing that, not trying to correct them, not trying to straighten them out. Just love them. And because they had been loved by Jesus, they were first in line to enroll in the School of Advanced Studies of Divine Love that was offered and taught by Jesus. So they were ready to learn more about Jesus. They were hungry to find more of that love and to be able to love as Jesus had loved them. But these good people of Nazareth, they didn't want any part of that love stuff. Mm -mm. <laughs> they were too busy. They were too busy taking offense at these people, like the people had taken offense at Jesus. Too busy pointing their fingers at judgment at others. Too busy counting the sins and the flaws of others. Too busy figuring out how to get these awful people out of their fine, holy town before they ruined it. However, living a life that is holy and blameless before God means living a life of love before God and for others. It means learning from Jesus how to receive grace and how to dispense God's marvelous grace. Here's God's simple expectation for you and me. Number one, receive. Receive God's love through the gift of Jesus Christ. That's where you've got to start, is accepting and receiving for yourself. And the second thing is, once you have received it, you're not done. <laughs> it's not over yet. You receive God's love, and the second thing, now you give it away. That's the simple rhythm of the Christian life. Receive it and give it away. Share it with others. Spread it throughout this world. It's as simple and as challenging as that. To be holy and blameless is not about reaching some unreachable level of morality that none of us can reach. It's all about learning to love. To be holy and blameless before God is to be fully in love with God and in love with all whom God has created. Learning firsthand the life of grace, these prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners, they now were finally able to live in love before God. So would you want to learn how to be holy and blameless before God in love? Would you like that for your own life? Would you, would, would, you, would you like for grace to more often cross into your life? Would you like those grace crossings coming your way? Well, here's some very practical, day-to-day, grace-filled ways of living, which uh, I didn't come up with, but author, preacher, and educator Leonard Sweet shared these, and, and I really liked them. I've held on to them. One of the simple things, one number one, first the first practical grace crossing, the grace habit that, that you can find to, to experience this life of being homeless, holy, and blameless is try to turn any criticism of others into a celebration of them. That's a helpful discipline to work upon. We have no right to criticize another if we cannot first celebrate the beauty of the other. Here's how Leonard Sweet puts it. He says, if I can't say three positive things about someone else and lift her up with prayer and thanksgiving to God, I have no warrant for complaint. So before any of that word of criticism leaves your mouth, stop and say, okay, first, how can I celebrate? How can I recognize God in this other person before you? Through all the years, through the years, I have had a I don't, do any of y'all collect things? You know, some people collect stamps. Some people collect this, that, and I've been collecting pelicans for a few years. Look in front of the parsonage, there's a big old pelican. That's Pedro. Inside you'll find Pete. And then you'll have pelican pictures. And I've just been collecting pelicans for years because I came across a book that really lifted me up in one of those seasons that I was so down. It was called The Wisdom of Pelicans by a Presbyterian a minister named uh, David McClaw. And, and, and David tells in that story several things that helped me out. But 
Among other things, there was a story he tells about the Bambima tribe in South Africa. And that tribe had a very unusual way of administering justice in their community. We, we like to make sure justice is served, right? And this is how they serve justice in their community. Whenever someone in that tribe acted irresponsibly or did something wrong, that person is placed in the very center of the village all alone and unfettered, just standing there. And all the rest of the men and the women and the children of that tribe would gather in this large circle around the accused. And when all were there, then each person, one by one, would speak directly to the accused about all the good things that he or she has done in their lifetime. They would share all the positive attributes, the generous deeds, the strengths, and the kindness that the, of the accused were identified carefully and at length. And no one was allowed to fabricate, fabricate something and be kind of flippant about this. They weren't, able, they weren't allowed to exaggerate or to be facetious. They just simply looked them in the eye and told them what they saw of, that was good inside of them. And this ceremony could not only last hours, it come, sometimes would last several days, and it would not cease until everyone was drained of every positive comment that could be made by this person who had done wrong, this person in question. And then, and only then, is that circle broken, followed by a joyous celebration as the person who is now broken down with all that love and grace is welcome back into the tribe. I like the way Brother David in this letter, <laughs> he says, I'm so afraid that some Christian missionaries will get in that tribe and mess them up because any time a lot of Christians get in a circle around somebody, it's not to give them good, good blessings and thoughts, but to throw stones at them. You know, we need to learn the way of grace that Jesus has talked to us about. You know, this is grace that we're talking about. This is grace, replacing criticism with celebration. And that's grace, and that'll go a long way. That's another thing he suggests, uh, Leonard Sweet. He said the second, the second suggestion is that we substitute understanding for argument. Think about that for a moment. It, this is a bit more challenging. I'll give you that. Sweet says that he no longer lets himself get drawn into an argument with anybody unless he can first state their opinion, their position, back to them in such a way that they approve and agree with he finally understands what they are really saying. He wants to make sure he understands the other before he ever argues with them. What, what a wonderful gift that for us to offer others, taking the time to truly listen, to really understand where the other is coming from. My friends, that's hard work. It's one of the hardest works I've ever been challenged with. But it is worth the effort. Love is worth the effort. You may be surprised how many times this little grace crossing, this grace habit will require you to keep your mouth shut. Just listen. If we would just practice this habit in our lives each day, we might prevent ourselves from saying things that we never should have said. And we might rediscover what grace is all about. This is the third thing. A very practical, daily grace habit that you can take with you. Practice listening to our friends to build our confidence and courage, but also listen to our enemies for wisdom. And information. Here's, here's how Sweet explains this. Our enemies are sometimes the best source for helping us understand how we need to change and grow. In order to learn from our enemies, it's necessary for us to see them as fellow human beings. 
Because if we in turn try to demonize them, make them less than human, we won't listen to them. We won't learn from them. You recall what Jesus told us to do with our enemies? I mean, if you want to follow the way of Jesus, what did he say? <laughs> he said we're to love our enemies. <laughs> love our enemies. I was told one time, I read it, and I don't know who said it, but it stuck with me through the years that the church is a training ground for helping us learn how to be Christians out in the world. And, and, and the Bible's going you know, to learn what to do, what the Bible says. And the Bible says, love your enemies. So how are we going to learn, be able to learn how to love those enemies out in the world? Well, first of all, the church provides us with a lot of people we don't like. And we got to learn how to love them. <laughs> and once we get to love one another, then we might have a better chance of doing it out there. Okay? Love your enemies. And the only way we can do that is to see our foes as human. And to be willing to let them teach us more about ourselves. Friends, that's grace. That's grace. Another thing, every day of our lives, we have this choice before us. You got a choice. You're going to spread kudos or kudzu. <laughs> Y'all remember when kudzu came into this uh, uh, country? <laughs> Thought it was a wonderful thing. Kudos, of course, are compliments. We appreciate getting kudos. People telling us what a fine job we did. People appreciating what effort we have done to give in this world, you know. Kudos are, are good things to receive, but kudzu are complaints and criticisms that tend to spread like kudzu. And eventually, you know what that kudzu is going to do? If, that's all, if all, all you choose is to spread kudzu, it's going to choke the life out of everything it touches. So instead, let us strive to be compulsive complimenters. What would happen in your family, with your friends, and with your co-workers if you became a champion of kudos? My guess is that you'd begin to experience more and more of God's grace. And, and there's finally one more thing. This other grace habit of de-chipping your shoulder. Sweet wonders. Why do we Christians have such a tremendous capacity to take offense? Why do we do that? Especially when most of what hurts and offends us are matters of the highest in consequence. It doesn't really matter. Instead of getting all worked up over those things which aren't that life changing <laughs> instead we need to seek to desensitize ourselves from taking offense at what others say and do again this is hard i have to catch myself all the time because something will be said and i'll just get so angry and i i've got to stop because i want to spurt back instead of just making a choice to offer kudos instead of cut to to take that chip off my shoulder. Because we all have those chips that we've put on our shoulders. Nobody put it there but ourselves, you see. When we do this, when we're willing to take that chip off our shoulders, when, you know, if we would do that, it would be possible for us to be more loving friends, to be a more, you know, loving spouses, to be more loving parents and children, and to, and to basically be more loving neighbors. So, so how would things be different in your life if you de-chipped your shoulder? You know what it is that ticks you off. I know what it is that ticks me off. Would grace be more apt to be found if you decided to take those chips off your shoulder? I think so. So simply, I want to do this today. I just want to invite you to join with me. Pray for me, and I'll pray for you as we together begin to seek to live our lives with more grace and more love, to remind ourselves that we are a people of love. We're a people of grace. And as we do this, God promises us that God's going to make us, yes, even the flawed creatures that we are, God will make us into a holy, 
and blameless people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Gracious God, have mercy. <laughs> so often we've sought to earn your mercy and grace, and, and we've refused to accept them as the gifts of love that you intend for them to be for us. Forgive us, Lord, and, and, and help us to understand that we must freely accept your gift of love in order that we might freely share that love and that grace and pass it on to others. Sometimes, Lord, we find it easier, O oh God, to love people in theory than to actually practice loving and offering grace in person. Let the strength of your love in us <coughs> encourage us to develop these grace-filled habits so that grace may cross our lives more often and so that everyone around us may experience anew your loving spirit. This we pray in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. So we have before us five simple things that we are called to do as we seek to try to be live grace-filled lives. We're called to, to, to offer ourselves in God and love and trusting that, that God will help us to turn our criticisms of others into celebration, to, to, to choose to have understanding rather than argument, to have uh, listening to our friends but also listening to our enemies. And then, of course, we need to spread kudos, not kudzu. Take that ship off your shoulders. Help and pray that I can take mine off mine. Let us stand as we sing about grace and allow God's grace to enter us again as we turn in our hymnal to number 365. Grace is greater than all of our sin together. <laughs> Greater than all our 
Now may we all allow grace to cross into our lives anew and go and share the good news of grace with all by the way you live, with the words of your lips, by the deeds of your hands, and with the prayers in your minds, and through the love in your hearts. May the grace of Christ redeem you, the enduring love of God support you, and the friendship of the Spirit accompany you this day and evermore. Amen. Thank you for joining us to worship today at the Church on the Square in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Whether you are here in person, on the radio, or watching us on live stream, know that here's a place that we can walk together to seek to find grace to make a difference in our lives so that we can make a difference in the world. You're all welcome to join us in Christ's name. Go in peace.